evening, everyone. Welcome once again to our another session of with uh, Arthur Bergeron. She almost forgot my name. This is a bad. Oh, no, I did. <laughs> After all these years. I did. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Who say um, going to be we're getting doing all a brief? Joys. This is what. Sorry, <clears throat> we were on camera. We're sorry. We're uh, tonight's presentation is asset protection and tax avoidance, which is quite a good topic um, these days. So um, without further ado, I'm so happy that you are all here and welcoming Arthur back again. And Joyce, we're thank you so much. Later. It's, it's, thank you so much thank for you. inviting us, right? It's just a pleasure to be back for the last presentation of the 2016 series. I think it was Joyce or Tom that said, I think it's been 10 years now that I've, <laughs> we've been doing this. So today's, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Arthur Bergeron, uh, and I'm an attorney at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, and you can see that, okay. In Myrick O'Connell, there are 60 of us. There are 40 in Worcester and 20 in Westboro, and everybody does a special thing. We're a multi-specialty firm, which means I get to do nothing but this, uh, which is figuring out elder law issues. Uh, and the purpose of these presentations is really to kind of, to, well, we do some presentations which are pretty more, more general in nature, and we're trying to answer a whole bunch of kind of basic trivia questions about Elder Law 101, 101 and stuff, and trust, that was the last one that we really focused on. Um, so today, this is a little more complicated, and I'm sorry that it's gonna be a little more complicated because there's a little more math in this one, because we're talking about this issue which often comes up for me, because uh, I do a lot of work with folks who are um, either worried about nursing home possibilities in the future or worried about getting frail and trying to manage to live at home without going to a nursing home or go to a nursing home without going broke. And then there are people that are in the middle of that <coughs> catastrophic situation uh, and they're trying to figure out what to do maybe because they hadn't quite planned as much as they had, should have. Um, and, I, and, and one of the things you've heard me say before is that uh, anybody, anybody can qualify for mass health. You can always qualify for mass health. The only question is, do you want to qualify for mass health? And people would, uh, would sometimes say, well, why wouldn't I, you know, if mass health is going to give me all these benefits and stuff? But that's really what today is about. We're going to talk about how you balance the, 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 your desire for asset protection and for making sure you can qualify for government benefits uh, versus some costs so that you can figure out re really on the whole, is that what you want to do? So, You've all seen my friends, I seem, that seems, they seem to be out of focus though. That's the guess, but you've all seen my friends Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. You've all heard me say that their goal is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And Frank's goal if he dies is to make sure Mary inherits everything, all things being equal. And, Fra and Mary's goal is that when she dies everything is going to get liquidated, which means turned into money, and given to the kids. And that's kind of their general their, their goal, and, they, and, and one of their other goals, of course, which is the corollary, is they don't want to waste money giving it to people they really didn't want to give it to in the first place, that is the government. They're not looking to pay more taxes than they have to. They're not especially interested in leaving something to the nursing home. I've yet to see a will that says, oh, and I really want to leave $100,000 to the nursing home. Um, and they're interested in avoiding probate. Now, I'm, I, Originally, I designed this to talk about these three things and how to do things also so as to avoid probate. But the cost of probate just isn't that big. Cost of probate is about five or ten thousand dollars. And so, compared to these other two six hundred pound gorillas, the probate issue isn't as big. Uh, it's an important issue for folks who aren't worried about these others. Um, but I want to focus on asset protection, which is really um, dealing with nursing home issues versus taxes. So. Before you can, you can kind of see how to weigh this out, I want to tell you, I want to remind you of the situation that would happen uh, if Mary needed nursing home care and Frank and Mary were together. And that is that at least under today's rules, um, uh, Mary could qualify for mass health fairly quickly in all cases. And the reason for that is that while Mary, if she's in a nursing home and is otherwise medically eligible for, for mass health, um, wants to qualify for mass health, she has to show she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. Frank can own the home as long as it has an equity of less than $828,000. And for those of you in Martha's Vineyard, and which means that some of you folks, the house inadvertently kind of is more than $828,000, you can always get down to that number, uh, or Frank could, by getting a reverse mortgage and just pulling some of the equity out. Because the question is not whether your house is worth more than 828 
question is whether the equity is less than 828. Um, Frank can have other countable assets, which means cash, stocks, bonds, IRAs, 401ks, et cetera, of up to, worth up to $119,220. But most importantly, Frank can have infinite income. And therefore, if Mary needed to qualify for Mass Health, she would simply shift all of her assets to Frank. Frank would keep the house, because it's, if it's worth less than $828,000, Frank would then take, keep, say, $100,000 in the bank, use the rest to buy an annuity, as long as the annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's la actuarial life expectancy, which if Frank were 85, his life expectancy would be about six years. There's a table for this. It doesn't mean that no one cares how healthy you really are. It's just how you do on the table, right? As long as Frank can buy this annuity, as long as it calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than his actuarial life expectancy, he can buy an infinitely large annuity and the day after he does, thereby putting him below $119,220 in assets, because the income stream doesn't count as an asset, uh, as long as Mary only has less than $2,000, Mary's going to qualify for mass health. <clears throat> now, when he's doing those things, uh, Frank is realizing, among other things, that in the absence of a need to qualify Mary for mass health, Frank would never buy this annuity, right? These annuities are so-called well, you call the, the insurance companies to buy one. They're actually called Medicaid qualifying annuities. It's the only reason you buy it, because the interest rate's terrible, right? You earn about like 1% interest on this money. So if Frank had his money in other kinds of investments, like annuities or whatever, like that annuity right there that, that, that he owns for $100,000, that might be earning 3 or 4 or 5% if it's an old one, right? Why would he ever cash that in to start earning money at 1%? Well, he wouldn't unless he needs to qualify Mary for Mass Health because by doing that he's saving you know the difference between you know the, between Mary's income which is $750 a month which she would have to pay Mass Health or she would have to pay the nursing home at, after she qualified for Mass Health and the rest which if it were at Windermere I think is about twelve thirteen thousand dollars a month right now if it's yeah between twelve and fourteen thousand I don't remember how much Windermere is right now but it ain't it ain't cheap right so if you're Frank and Mary and you're in this situation and you've got, you've got a house worth about 300000 and Frank's got an IRA of one hundred and fifty, and they've got an annuity and they've got a joint bank account of about six hundred and fifty. <clears throat> why wouldn't you do that? You mean, this is, this is, in this kind of situation, this is pretty much bread and butter. You always want to qualify Mary for mass health by doing what I said, shift everything to Frank, right? Have Frank go buy that annuity. He's in business. But what if their assets look more like that? Right? What if what if they had a house worth four hundred thousand dollars, a cottage um, that was worth three hundred thousand dollars, or in the case of a lot of folks here, uh, you know, a main house that's worth quite a bit, but then you've also got a rental house that's like on the property, uh, an IRA that's worth um, three hundred thousand dollars that Frank's got. Mary's got an IRA now of two hundred thousand. They've got the annuity's worth a little bit more, two hundred thousand. They've got some savings, so now their assets are a million five. Right? So the question is, in this situation, is it still a good idea, or when is it still a good idea, for Mary to, to qualify for mass health, to do all of the shifting around that is necessary in order to qualify for mass health? Now, a piece of that analysis, oh, and by the way, because it's going to be important later on, I've got to tell you more about their income, Frank and Mary. So uh, Frank, in this case, has got $2,000 a month coming in in Social Security, and Mary has 1000 so those are, the, those are the annual incomes on the right. They, they're earning about $10,000 a year off of their cottage. Um, Frank has an I, Frank's IRA is paying an RMD, a re required minimum distribution. That's the amount he's pulling every year, or $3,000. Mary's pulling two. And then that annuity is paying them $4,000 a year in interest because it's earning 4% on, on an annuity of $100,000. So. Their total income is $55,000. So, and as I said, you know, there's a lot of math here, and that's why usually these presentations, I go right to the end, and then I take questions, but I'm going to stop a couple places just to ask if people have got, you know, any particular questions or if you're following along. No quizzes, though. I'm just going to stop and ask, right? Any questions? So, we're assuming that this is their income, and you've seen their assets. And the question is, what do Frank and Mary need to know in order to figure out whether in this situation they want Mary should be trying to qualify for mass health? Well, you know, first they kind of need to do an income analysis, as I was just mentioning. So if Mary qualifies um, uh, for mass health, 
Well, it's great that, the, that Mass Health is then going to be paying that nursing home bill, but their income is going to be going down by the amount that they've been earning on the cottage because in order for them to qualify for Mass Health, of course, they'd have to sell that cottage because they'd need to, Frank can keep his house, but everything else they're going to have to turn into cash in order to go buy that big annuity, right? Which means they've got to sell the cottage, so that income's going. Um, They've got that annuity loss. Remember, they were, he was make, they're making 4000 a year on the annuity, and that's going to turn into 1000 a year because the interest rate on the annuity is only going to be about $1,000 a month, you know, or 1% actually on all the money that they're going to put into the annuity. Because remember, in going back to, the, to their finances, what, what Frank's going to have to do here is keep his house, which is worth about $400,000. He's going to have to he's gonna keep another 100000 worth of savings, and then he's going to have to buy an annuity worth what? a million dollars, right? And he's only gonna be getting 1% interest on that million dollars, right? One, that's $10,000 a year in interest. So um, going back, there's, there's, so there's that, there's, that there's, the, there's the annuity that he's losing. There's the IRA. Remember in this situation, Mary had an IRA worth $200,000. Now, if we were only worried about taking Frank's IRA and turning it into one of these annuities, that conversion is not a taxable event. You can actually restructure your, your tax deferred money, your IRA and 401k money, without triggering a tax on all the money. But if Mary's in the nursing home and she has an IRA, she's got to cash hers out in order to give the money to Frank. So Frank can go buy the annuity. And that's going to be a tax hit. And we're going to talk about how you'd figure out that tax hit, but that's going to be a big tax hit. Um, so what we really need to do is kind of a tax analysis of what the effect of, would be of cashing out these assets, right? And so, and, and, and in the course of that, I'm gonna you know, digress a few times just to give you a few tip, kind of trivia tips, but that's kind of the core of this, is to see how you would analyze this. And the goal isn't to have you at the end of the night saying, wow, I really totally got it, now I can go do that analysis, but to give you a sense of the things that might, you know, give you pause and cause you to wanna to really try to figure this out. So once again, those are their assets. So, for, so we're going to talk a lot about taxes. First, we're going, to talk about, we're going to talk about income taxes, and then capital gains taxes, and then estate taxes. Oh boy, this is, I bet you were just dying for this presentation. You know, it's Christmas time. You just really wanted to hear a lot about taxes, right? So this is taxes 101. First of all, income taxes. So there are federal income taxes. There are state income taxes. The federal tax, as opposed to the state tax, which is pretty much a flat income tax of about 5%. The federal tax, as you have heard, as you know, um, you, get taxed on, you get taxed on marginal tax rates on different chunks of money. And you all kind of know that, but nobody kind of actually knows how the math for that works, right? You just kind of know that there's something about marginal rates, but the way you figure it out is you go look on the form. If you're, you know, or you press the button now when you're doing the tax and it tells you how much you owe. But this is how it actually works, right? Um, there are, there are, er, er, what the government does when, they're figure, when the federal government is figuring out how much to charge you in income tax, they take all of your, your taxable income, which means your you know, regular income minus deductions and all that stuff, your taxable income, and they divide it into these chunks. And they, div and they tax each chunk at a different rate. So if you earn taxable income, between zero and $18,550, and you're married, the tax rate on that money is only 10%. It's very low. Between 18,000 and 75,000, which is pretty substantial, it covers a lot of people, the rate's only 15%. Uh, after that, it starts going up more. It's between 75 and 151, it's at 25%. 151 to 231, it's at 28. And then finally, it hits 33%. Many people, have that kind of in the back of their mind. Oh, the federal tax rate, it's like 33%. Well, it only hits that if you're a married couple, if you're making up over a quarter of a million dollars, which of course Frank and Mary aren't making, unless they sell that cottage. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. So Frank and Mary's taxable income, if their taxable income, assume that all of their income, their $55,000 was all taxable. Now it's not. I know, I know that, you know, but it gets too complicated to figure out why that is, so we're just going to assume that. Assume that they're, they've got $55,000 in taxable income. This is what their tax would be, right? The government would say, okay, the first $18,555, we're going to charge you 10% on that, and that's 1855 
The rest of the, the 36,450, which gets you to the 55,000, we're going to tax at 15%. So there's their tax, $7,322.50. So that's actually what they would pay in tax this year. And the Massachusetts rate uh, would be a 5% income tax. So that's income tax. Now, capital gains. What is a capital gain? A capital gains, or what is a capital gains? Tax is a tax that you pay on capital gain. Capital gain is considered by the government to be a special kind of income. It's the income that you make on something if you bought it for a little and sold it for a lot and kept it in the meantime for at least a year. That's the rule. If you kept it for a year, you bought it low and you sold it high, you pay a capital gains tax. How do you figure out the tax? Well, um, the, the tax, so and we're gonna, to the, for the example, we're just going to use Frank and Mary's house. What if Frank and Mary decided they were going to sell their house here, right? Instead of Frank keeping the house, which he want, would pr probably do for mass health purposes, he doesn't need to sell it. What if they were going to sell their house? Um, remember, their house is worth $400,000. Well, what would their capital gain be if they sold their house? Well, it is, the capital gain is the adjusted sales price, which is the sales price minus commissions, legal fees, blah, blah, little stuff, right? The adjusted sales price. Um, and by the way, it's not the adjusted sales price minus the mortgage. I'm amazed how many people think they can, you know, can figure out, oh, I'm not going to pay a capital gain. I owe a ton on the mortgage. Mortgage doesn't count, right? That's why some people, you know, they, they can lose money on their property, or what they think, uh, but still have to owe a capital gains tax. So it's the difference between adjusted sales price and basis. What is basis? Basis is typically purchase price plus major improvements. So it's the price they paid for the house plus the price they paid for like big things in the house. How big? Go talk to your accountants about that. I can't figure that out. You know, what is it that, like a big, a, a, an addition is definitely big. A bathroom is definitely big. You know, painting the house is not, right? So it's, it's the basis is, and, and so the, the, the moral of that story, by the way, save your receipts. Save your receipts. You know, you go to sell the house 30, 40 years after you bought it, and you did all this stuff, show me. Show me what you paid for all that stuff. And your labor doesn't count. So the capital gain is adjusted sales price minus basis. Um, the capital gains tax, federally, it varies a little bit, but I'm going to assume that it's, that it's 20%. That's about right, OK? Massachusetts, it varies a little bit, but we're going to assume that that's 5%. So the total typical capital gain tax that you pay on a capital gain if you're selling real estate in Massachusetts is about 25%. So we're going to kind of assume that going through this. So here we go. Remember, Mary, they're, they're selling their house $400,000. We're going to assume that the adjusted sales price is the sales price. We're going to say the purchase price was $30,000. This is not uncommon, right? They've owned their house for 40 years. I remember I bought my first house. We bought our first house in 1978 for $30,000. Right? It's worth a lot more than that now. You know? So that, that's not, uh, this is not unusual for clients of mine. Uh, they put in improvements worth 20. That's not very much. That's a bathroom, right? Used to be two bathrooms. Now that's like one bathroom, $20,000. So their basis is purchase price plus improvements, $50,000. And their capital gain is $350,000 if they sell their house. Any questions so far? Mm, we're good? OK. So what is going to be the tax on all of that? Well, as long as they own that house uh, and have lived in it for two years, two of the previous five years, they're not going to pay any capital gains tax. Because after they figure out the capital gain, which we found out was $350,000, right? They get to subtract. Each one of them has a $250,000 capital gains exclusion that they get by virtue of being, just being there, as long as they have been there for two of the previous five years. So they've got $500,000 worth of exclusion. Their capital gain was only $350,000, so they didn't have, they're not going to pay any capital gains tax. right? Now, I mentioned this two out of the last five years, by the way. So many people, um, if you were looking to, to do probate avoidance and a little bit of mass health type protection with regarding your house. One way to do that, the cheapest way to do that, uh, is to deed the house to your kids and keep a life estate in the house. Right? You transfer a so-called remainder interest to your kids. You keep a life estate. Um, if you do that, at the moment of your death, first of all, your life estate evaporates, leaving the kids as the owners of the house. 
which means the property doesn't have to go through probate. Oh, great, you saved some money. That's good, right? And five years after you have transferred that remainder interest to your kids, that interest in the house is safe in the event that you need to qualify for Mass Health. Mass Health will allow you to qualify. We'll say the remainder interest doesn't count. They will put it, if you're in the nursing home, they'll put a lien on your life estate. But when you die, your life estate evaporates, and therefore so does the lien. So this is a, a popular and cheap way of, of, uh, of um, doing some, as, some asset protection and some probate avoidance. Your problem, though, if you're Frank and Mary and you've transferred those, that interest to your kids, uh, and now you want to sell the house because you, know, you want to downsize or you want to sell the house, well, you've got a couple problems. One of them, of course, is that the kids have got to give their remainder interest back to you so that you can sell this house. Um, because if they don't, um, they're going to pay a capital gains tax on their piece of the house, which, if you're old, is probably about 80% of the value of the house because they don't live there, right? <coughs> The, the second thing is sometimes they just don't want to give it back to you because they don't want to give it back to you, right? Uh, or somebody's leaned the house. I had a lady here actually in Vineyard Haven who called me, oh, this must have been like four years ago. A lady called, I'd never dealt with her before. She said, Mr. Bergeron, I just want to talk to you about my estate plan. Sure, I came over. She said, you know, I, when I, I want to protect my house. I transferred a remainder interest to my son, you know, and that's great. And I only got one child, so I figured this is nice and easy. It's probate avoidance. I'm saving the house. It's more than five years. Great. She said the only thing is her, 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 his wife just served him with divorce papers. Is this a problem? I said, oh yeah, that's a problem. I said, because he owns the remainder interest in your house, in your $600,000 house. He owns 80% of it, the remainder interest, and that's going to be in play in that divorce. Right? So that aside, assuming the kids will give you back the house because you want to go sell it, don't forget, you've got to live there another two years. Right? Because you haven't owned that remainder interest, right? You'd given it away. So you've got to get it, you have to have owned the whole house and lived there for two years before you can sell and, and get your capital gains exclusion. So anyway, uh, if, you, if that's the case, you get your, your, your exclusion. Um, so there's, the, there's the, uh, the, now if it weren't the case, if they hadn't been living there for the last two of the last five years, purchase, the sales price would be 400,000, basis is 50, capital gain is 350. Tax is 25%. That's 25% of 350, $87,500. Any questions so far? No? We're all good? Isn't this exciting? Right? Uh, so I'm going to turn you, give you a couple other pieces of kind of trivia related to this just because we're kind of on the topic. So um, if Frank dies, though, and he has owned, been owning the house with Mary jointly, and, and then Mary becomes the owner of the house, um, Going back to this whole basis thing, remember they bought the house uh, for 30,000 and they did improvements of, of, of 20, so their total basis is 50. Well, as far as the IRS is concerned, if two people own the house and they've, got, and they've done these improvements, they each get half of that basis. So really, Frank has a basis in the house of 25,000 and Mary has a basis of 25,000, right? Now, when somebody dies, um, their, their basis in any interest that they have in real estate jumps to the date of death value. So in this case, if Frank dies and he owns half of the house, basically, because they own the house jointly, the moment of his death, his basis in his half of the house jumps to, the to half of the date of death value. So in this case, if Mary then turned around and went to sell the house, this is how it would work, assuming that she still lived there, right? Um, she, here's her sales price is 400000 Her basis, right, her half of the basis is 25000 His basis jumped to half of the date of death value or $200,000. Remember, the sale price is 400000 So now the, the basis in the house is now 225000 400 minus 225 is 175 right? Mary's exemption, remember, Mary has a $250,000 exemption because she's been living there for two of the last five years. So her exemption is 250, which is more than 175, and therefore the tax is zero. <clears throat> but once again, just to show you what happens if the, in, in different situations, if that house were worth $800,000, you do the same math, but now the, the, the capital gain is bigger than her $250,000 exemption, right? And therefore she'd pay a tax of $31,250, which is 25% of the 125, which is subject to tax. Any questions on any of this part? 
So you can see that they have, so, and I, we already did that. Oh, and say, oh, so, but oh, I'm gonna go back to this. So say, by the way, that Frank owned the house when he died, right? Instead of Frank and Mary owning the house. And it was worth $800,000. Oh, look, she sells the house for 800,000. The basis jumped up to 800,000. Now the capital gain is zero, right? Isn't it a wonderful thing, right? Now, the reason why I mention this is you say to yourself, so, if we're married and we've got a house that's got a lot of capital gain potential in it, right? We wanna make sure that we transfer the house to the dead guy, to the guy who's dying, right? Before he dies, before he dies, so that we can play this game. Um, and, and of course, a lot of people, not just me, thought of that. And so the government, in order to deal with that, uh, created a rule which says that if you do that, if I am Mary in this case, and I give my house to Frank, my interest to Frank, knowing that he's gonna give it back to me when he dies, and he dies within a year, it is as if that transaction didn't happen, right? So when you, if, you're, if you're playing that game, you have to make sure that the guy who's dying lives for a year. I actually had that, I had that happen in Oak Bluffs. I got a wonderful couple in Oak Bluffs, had this beautiful house, two, three houses from the water. Um, and they know that when, um, and, and, the, and the husband is, has, has, has uh, had a, has a war-related, has war-related problems, right? I don't know if he's still, I haven't spoken to him for a while. So that's actually what we did, was we transferred the house to him because he was sick. Knowing that if he lived for a year, upon his death, his wife could sell the house, capital gains free, because the base was gonna jump to the day that death died, right? So it's, not, it's just something to kind of remember, as a, kind of as an aside. Um, so, one more thing. What if Peter, Paul, and Mary inherit the house from Frank and Mary? Sales, go back to the $400,000 house. $400,000 sales price, $400,000 basis, capital gain is zero. So there is an incentive, always, there's a big tax incentive to keeping property until you die so that you can pick up this stepped up basis. Now, in the back of some of your minds, you're thinking, oh, but isn't there an estate tax issue here? And we're gonna talk about that a little later. But in general, that's the reason. Now we're gonna do one more piece of income tax. We're gonna talk about the cottage. Has anyone heard of the term, a term depreciation recapture? No, no one's ever heard of this, right? This is, this is pretty bizarre. Um, so we're gonna talk about the cottage. So that's their cottage, right? They own a cottage on the Cape. Well, obviously, not if they're on Martha's Vineyard, but they've gotta pretend here. They've got a cottage on the Cape. Um, and they had bought it for, for 30 years ago for $100,000, and they put $100,000 worth of improvements in it. Right? Remember this cottage was worth, in my earlier slide, $300,000. So they bought it for 100, they put $100,000 in improvements in it, but they've been renting it out every year um, uh, and earning money on the cottage, right? Uh, and they had to report that to the government, right? They had to report that. And, and, they, and their income every year was their rental income minus their expenses and minus depreciation. What's that? What is depreciation? Depreciation is the amount that they are, they are allowed to subtract from their income every year on this real estate because the government assumes that the value of that property shrinks a little bit every year. Well, of course, that doesn't, in the case in real estate, but that's a kind of a fiction, right? just a useful, useful for us fiction. So that instead of actually having to pay uh, income tax every year on the rent minus the expenses, they get to pay it on the rent minus the expenses minus this make-believe number for depreciation. So they end up paying less in tax. Well, the government appreciates the fact that you're getting a real benefit that way, uh, and, but, 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 but therefore wants you to give some of that back when you go sell the property. And so when you're selling real estate to the extent that you have depreciated that real estate at all, the piece of the gain that you get, the piece of the income that you make from selling the property attributable to the piece be, the resulting from the fact that you depreciated the property down and now you're selling it, right? That amount gets taxed at ordinary income rates as opposed to just being taxed at capital gains rates. So let me show you how that works in this case. This is the, this is the, it's gonna get easier from here, okay? So if they sell the house, their sales price we're gonna say is $300,000. That was the original value of the cottage. And we're gonna say their basis is zero because remember, they bought it for 100, they had improvements worth 100, but they depreciated it every year for 30 years. And the length of time you depreciate a piece of real estate is, I can't remember, it's like 27 years or something. So at this point, their basis in this house is zero. 
So when they sell for $300,000, the government takes what they just earned, which is all 300,000, right, because their basis is zero, and it puts it into two piles. The pile that is attributed to the depreciation, which is the $200,000, remember, because their purchase price plus their improvements was 200,000, that's depreciated down, and then the rest. Now, the rest gets taxed at the capital gains rate, 25%. The recaptured depreciation, though, that $200,000 gets taxed at ordinary income rates. And remember, in this case, Mary and Frank's base income was $55,000. Remember, we already talked about that. So if they need to sell this cottage so Frank can go take the money and buy that annuity, right? they're picking up another $300,000 in income that year. Now, 100 of it just gets taxed at, at uh, the capital gains rates. But the other 200, the other 200 gets, ta gets just lumped in with their, their $55,000. So now all of a sudden, they made $255,000 that year, right? And how does that 200 gets taxed? Well, the first chunk, which is the difference between their income, which was, remember, 55,000, and the, and, the, uh, and the top of that, that lowest, that 15% that, that bracket, which was like 85 or something, gets taxed at 15%. The next chunk gets taxed at 25. The last $103,000 gets taxed at 28%, right? So their total tax just on that $200,000 is $51,000, $51,063. Remember their capital gains rate on the other 100,000 they had was 20%. There's the other, that's 20,000. Their state capital gains, remember that was 5% of the whole thing. That's 15, so they're gonna pay a tax of $86,000 when they sell that cottage for $300,000. That's a big hit. Now remember, if they both die and leave it to their kids, kids don't pay anything, right? Basis is, basis is $300,000, remember it stepped up, date of death value, kids sell it for $300,000, they get all the money. That's the reason why people hold on to their cottages, right, so that, they, so that the kids can pick up this, this step up in basis. Um, if just Frank died and Mary went to sell the cottage, adjusted sales price is would be 300000 Remember, Frank's basis in half the cottage, even though a piece of it is capital gain, it doesn't make any difference. His basis goes, jumps up to the date of death value of one fifty. So now her taxable amount would only be 150000 If they both die, there's no tax to the kids. Now, we just went through a lot of income tax stuff, but I've got to bore you a little bit more because we've got to talk about the estate tax just for a few minutes, because you're saying to yourself, yeah, but am I, aren't, aren't I supposed to be trying to avoid the estate tax, right? Isn't that one of the goals of estate planning is to try to avoid the estate tax? And the answer is yes, sometimes, you know, but you've got to weigh it out against what you're gaining by keeping property in your estate and therefore picking up that stepped up basis, right? So how does the estate tax work? Well. Quick history, the Massachusetts estate tax, like the federal estate tax, was created in the early 20th century. It was at a time very much like today, when uh, the country was, there, were a, there was a lot of, I don't wanna say a handful of people, but there were people accumulating big, big amounts of wealth in this country. And there was this sense, well, why should they, great that they earned it, but why should their kids, just because they got to be the kids of the Rockefellers, get all this money? And so that was really the, 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 as the political essence of the estate tax was to say that didn't seem fair. And so, except that back then, back then, it's hard to remember this, $40,000 was a lot of money. And so Massachusetts adopted this very estate tax table, the very same table that exists today, right? And, in, and according to that table, if you have an estate, a taxable estate worth more than $40,000, you pay an estate tax. And that estate tax is eight tenths of one percent of that first fifty thousand, from forty to ninety. And then in the next bracket, it works just like the federal income tax. It's all bracketed, right? And then the rate goes up the higher the bracket. In the next bracket, from ninety to one hundred forty, you pay one point six percent. Next bracket, you pay two point four. Go down to the bracket that includes a million dollars, the money between eight hundred forty thousand and a million forty. When you get there, on that bracket, you're paying five point six percent. Right, and so and that's actually how it still works. And so if you and if you had a ta if you had an estate, a taxable estate, go to the bottom line of 1.5 million dollars, 
that would be your estate tax, $68,240. But wait, you're saying, I, isn't there, I thought you didn't pay on the first million, right? Well, so a little more history. So what happened was over time, um, and I think this particular event actually occurred during my lifetime, I'm that old now, right? That I think it was in the 60s that someone came to realize that as a result of the increasing value of real estate, everybody was having to pay an estate tax. Because if you had a house, inevitably you had more than $40,000 worth of value. And so the state decided, you know, pressured of course by their constituents, well, we need to deal with that. Now, they could have dealt with it by changing the table, but they didn't. Instead, they just created this artificial number, this arbitrary number. They said, if your estate is worth less than a given amount of money, if I recall the original number was $100,000. If your estate is worth $100,000 or less, you don't pay any estate of tax at all. Now over time, as inflation has continued, that number has grown. The legislature has increased that, and so now that number is a million dollars. That's the number that you've heard of. So if you have an estate that is worth a million dollars or less, you pay zero in estate tax. Which then leads to the question, what happens if you have an estate of a million and one dollars? Well, how much do you pay, right? So uh, different states um, have treated that in different ways. Until recently, Rhode Island's estate tax and, and that of uh, other states was always referred to as a cliff tax. In, the, in their case, in Rhode Island, if your estate, you didn't pay any estate tax if it was less than like $650,000. But if you were a dollar over, and they had one of these little charts, like the little the table that I showed you, if you were a dollar over, you paid everything you would have paid under the table. Right, which was like $36,000. So $650,000 you paid zero, $650,001 you paid $36,000 in tax, right? So you can imagine the estate planning they got played around with in that state. So the way Massachusetts did it is they said, okay, you get your million dollar exemption, but then once your estate is over a million dollars, we, we want you to catch up with what you would have paid under the table. Right under that, under that table that I show, not like under the table, but under the table that I show you. Um, and so what we're gonna do is, once you're over a million dollars, we're gonna tax you the lesser of, the lesser of, the amount that you would have paid under the on the table, according to the table, or 40% of all the dollars over a million dollars. So if your estate is a million and one dollars, you owe the government 40 cents. If your estate is a million one hundred thousand dollars, you owe the government forty thousand dollars, right? Uh, and so, and 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 then and then at some point the the, the lines cross and, and you're back to the table. So, for example, if you owe, if you have an estate of a million dollars, according to the table, the table that I showed you, you should be paying the government thirty six thousand five hundred sixty dollars. But actually, you pay them zero because you get the first million for free, right? If you if your estate is a million one hundred thousand dollars. Under the, according to the table, you should have paid 42,640. But 10% of all the dollars over a, hundred, over a million, which is 10% of, of, or excuse me, 40% of all the dollars over a million, which is 40% of $100,000, is $40,000. And that's less than 42, and therefore you only pay $40,000 in tax. On an estate of a million two hundred thousand dollars by that time, you, you, the system is caught up with the table. So using the table, you owe $49,000. If you were taking 40% of all the dollars over a million, that would be 40% of $200,000 or $80,000. The lower number is 49,040, so now you're on the table. And from then on in, you're back to being on the table. So, going to the earlier slide, if your estate is a million five, your estate tax is, is $68,240, right? And if you're Frank and Mary, and you um, and you take and you have a cot in that cottage, and you're trying to decide whether you want to uh, uh, sell the cottage and go do something else with the money in order to avoid the estate tax on on that three hundred thousand dollars, right? Um, or keep it and leave it to your kids so that your kids can sell the cottage. Here's the comparison: you you saw what they were going to pay in tax if they sold the cottage. It was like eighty thousand dollars, right? They hold it until they die. That that extra three hundred thousand dollars gets included in their estate for estate tax purposes. The estate tax on that three hundred thousand dollars is about five or six percent, about fifteen or eighteen thousand dollars, right? So they save for their kids 
like $70,000 by holding on to that property until they die. It's like a huge number. So there's this huge incentive to hold the property until you die. So when, when Frank and Mary are trying to figure out in general whether to qualify Mary for mass health, to go back to where we started, they have to figure out, among other things, in this case, the, the, sale, the sales taxes, the cost of the, whatever the cost might be of the sale of the old annuity, the loss in interest from, the, from going from an annuity that's paying 4% to one that's paying 1%, the taxes that Mary would have to pay on her $200,000, right? Um, so there's a whole bunch of kind of balancing considerations. Even if you're really faced with the prospect right then of Mary needing to qualify for mass health. If, they were, if you're thinking of this in terms of pre-crisis planning, right? if Frank and Mary are simply coming to me saying, so I really don't, I, we want to make sure that we, that we um, um, are protected in the event that one of us needs nursing home care, and I'm talking to them about what to do, do they want to gift the cottage to their kids right now? Eh, you know, if they give their kids the cottage, they're giving them their basis. And when the kids go to sell the cottage, they're going to pay a tax on the entire amount that they ever sell the cottage for. So they really want to be trying to hold on to it, right? If they give the kids their house, their basis is going to be zero. And by the way, in that situation, if they give the kids the house so that each of the kids owns a third of the house, and then they go to sell the house, remember some of the house, the taxes at capital gains rates, but most of it, the taxes at ordinary income rates. And so interestingly, if you're Peter and you're in a high income tax bracket and you're making 250 a year, you're probably going to be paying 33% on all the money you get, right? If you're Paul and you're only making 100,000 a year, you're probably going to be paying 25%. If you're Mary and you're in a much lower bracket, you're only paying 15%. So if Frank and Mary thought that they were treating their kids equally by giving them the cottage in that case, they really weren't. They were really giving Mary a lot more than they gave Peter because Mary's taking a lot more home after taxes, right? Um, one alternative in order to get that, in order to make sure they get that tax basis uh, step up is to transfer the property to the kids and retain a life estate. We already talked about that one though. There may be some problems with that. A second alternative, and this is the, re this is the time um, when irrevocable trusts show up. Um, especially if you own a cottage or if you own a second property. Um, you may want to be transferring that property to an irrevocable trust which has character, certain characteristics to it, which I won't go into because that's a whole other class, um, that cause that trust to be a so-called grant or taxable trust so that as far as the government is concerned, the house is still yours, even though as far as mass health is concerned, it's not anymore. The remainder interest has been transferred away. So it's a way to make sure that there's still a, a, a step up in basis in the property and that the house gets um, protected. Which is better? It's hard to say. Is, is, it, is it a good idea for Frank and Mary to sell their house now or to sell it later? On the house, as we've seen, it kind of doesn't make any difference because their, their, their exemption is so high, right? As long as, as, long as their, their combined exemption is lower than what they would have paid in capital gain, that they're probably not going to have to pay a tax. One other thing, I'm going to jump over those slides, they're boring. Um, the Qualified Personal Residence Trust. I'm just going to mention this because it applies especially here and in the other island. I also did this presentation on the other island, right? Because um, I always tell people now for when I'm here, you know, you want to know where your property values are, go are going to go? Go see the other island. But the same thing playing out. It's only the numbers are just much higher. So um, back before 2000, when the federal income tax, or the federal estate tax rather, applied to estates of over a million dollars. And the federal estate tax rates, as opposed to the Massachusetts ones, are very high, right? Uh, a lot of people were sold this notion of, of using a device to basically make sure that their home didn't get included in their estate. Because the homes, especially here and on the other island, you know, were of so much value, that it was, it was causing a substantial estate tax, you know, 40%, 45% of the total value. And so this product was developed called a QPERT, a Qualified Personal Residence Trust. And the basic game was that you would create a trust, you would, the, the parents would transfer this interest into the trust, um, and then after a short time, the parents would start paying uh, uh, rent 
to the, to the trust. And the trust would be owned by the kids. And the goal of this whole exercise was to keep there from being any uh, um, uh, uh, other income taxation that occurred, but finally to make sure that the house wasn't included in the parents' estate for estate tax purposes. And that was considered to be extremely important, right? And it worked great. Right? Because it kept the property from being included in the estate for estate tax purposes. Except the reason why it wasn't included was because as far as the government was concerned, the parents had made a gift. They gifted the property to the kids. Well, what happens if you gift the property to the kids? You give them your basis. So as a result, we have properties, and there are a number of them here, right? where people inherited the property from their parents who were delighted that the parents didn't have to pay any estate, that there wasn't an estate tax. But remember, the rate on the estate tax is 6%. But now they're trying to sell the property, and they realize they're going to pay a capital gains tax on the whole value at 25%. This is a gigantic capital gains tax. And the reason why I mention that is that, is that um, if, if you've got one of those, uh, or you know somebody who has, you probably want to get that unwound if you can. We've done a lot of those where the kids basically retransfer the property to the parents so that, as long as the parents have had it for a year, right, the basis of the property will step up to the date of death value. Because by including it in the estate for estate for, for Massachusetts for estate tax purposes, for Massachusetts estate tax purposes, you end up being able to give a tremendous benefit to your kids because you allow them to avoid the capital gains tax. I just mentioned that because it may apply to some folks. Now, that's a, that's, a, that's a smaller group. Now, finally, unwinding the cupid. To conclude, when you're trying to figure this out, right, especially if you're in crisis mode, somebody is going to a nursing home, somebody has got dementia and is kind of slipping away and you're trying to figure it out, and you go to talk to a lawyer about it, don't just talk to your lawyer. You need to talk to, well, you don't have to talk to me, but you have to talk to a lawyer, an elder law attorney. But you also want to talk to a tax guy. Right? That may be your CPA. It may be a tax attorney. CPAs are usually cheaper, right? As long as they know what they're doing, as long as, they, as long as they've dealt with this stuff, right? And you want to talk to your investment guy. Because what the decision of whether to qualify someone that you know for mass for mass health, that's a, a, a piece of the equation is the, the benefits you say the benefits that you get and therefore the money you save because of the nursing home bill. But there are prices on the other side, and if, especially if you have significant assets, you've got to balance those up. You have to try to balance those up, okay? Uh, so, if you just thought that was terrific, but it was really confusing and you want to see it again, as you know, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary. Also, I want to thank the folks at Martha's Vineyard Cable. Fra Tom, thank you very much for, for taping again, and, and th I think they play these over, on the, and they can, you can also download them. Uh, as you can download any of the presentations that I've done here before. Any question? <laughs> I know that was just a lot of stuff, you know, and you probably weren't like ready for this for Christmas time. Yes, sir? It sounds simplistic, but if Frank and Mary are healthy and happily married and enjoying life until one of them dies, probably not as major as you before here, because if Mary dies, Frank's got a lot of time on his hands. He's got an opportunity to acquaint himself with much of what you've discussed. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that if you're happy and healthy and having a, an enjoyable life, enjoy it as much as you can until one of the spouses dies, and then the problem. So the question is, or no, I shouldn't say, the comment is, so wouldn't it, doesn't it just make sense if you're, if you're Frank and Mary and you're both okay, and you do have these abilities to kind of shift things around while both of you are alive, why even think about this until one of you has died? So the only th thing I would just mention about that is that one of the things that happens if one of them dies is that the planning options of the second one become much more uh, constrained, right? Whereas if while both of them are alive, are alive they have the option of, of having each of their wills say, if I die, whatever I own is going to go in trust for my spouse so that if my spouse then needs to qualify for mass health, whatever those assets are gonna be safe, right? And if that is what the will says, and as long as you get the assets into that person's name before that person dies, the spouse's assets are safe. If on the other hand, as in the Frank and Mary example, 
They want if Frank dies to leave everything to Mary, and Mary now owns everything. And then she's got concerns, she and the kids, about dealing with these asset questions. Now, she, in order to protect any of that stuff, she actually does have to give it away and wait five years. That's the famous five-year look-back period. So I'm just saying, it may be that you are right, but I guess it would be worth your having a conversation with someone to talk that out, to decide whether, on the whole, you might not want to have some, protect, some protection so that if one person dies, the other one's going to be safe. But point is well taken. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. When you're talking about estate, estate tax, am I right that that just refers to the estate tax that is money? Does the estate refer to only physical property? No. The estate refers to everything, everything of value that 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 someone else gets to own as a result of your death. So it includes so it, so it includes real estate, all bank accounts, life insurance proceeds, uh, IRAs, 401k, even your IRAs and 401k. Even though, when if if you're if you say that your death beneficiary, of, so if once again if it's, your, if it's your spouse, there's a marital deduction, so you don't have to worry about it. But say one of you has died and the, and the other one dies, you got a three hundred thousand dollar IRA. And, and the death beneficiaries are your kids, and all of your assets put together are worth a million five. Well, that 300,000 gets thrown in that pot. At 300,000, not after tax, it's the before tax number. So they pay the estate tax on the money, and then when the kids take it out, they pay an income tax on the money, again. Right? So there's a lot of, yeah, so that the estate, there's often a confusion between the probate estate, which is the, the consists of the things that you own just in your name at the time of your death. And therefore, someone needs to figure out who gets them, and that's the job of the probate court. So those assets go through probate. But that's, that's different from, and usually much smaller than, the taxable estate, which consists of everything. Everything that, that even if you don't actually have control over, like a life insurance policy, right? Everything, all money that, that somebody gets to get as a result of your death. That's your estate, taxable estate. Okay? Other question? Mm, yes, ma'am. Um, if you own property outside of Massachusetts or even outside of the country, is that considered an asset in Massachusetts? If you own property outside of Massachusetts, is it considered an asset in Massachusetts? If you die a resident in Mass of Massachusetts, yes. Okay. Yes, you get a credit on your estate tax for any estate taxes that you might have paid in that other place as a result of the real estate that you owned in the other place, right? But even if there is no estate tax in that other place, it's included in your estate here, right? By the way, conversely, if you become a Florida resident, say, right, but you still own your Martha's Vineyard house, when you die, right, Massachusetts will still charge you an estate tax and, and, the, and the, way, the way they'll compute it is they'll compute the entire value of your entire estate, including everything, Florida, everything, right? Then they'll do a ratio. What is the ratio of the value of your, Mass your Martha's Vineyard house to the rest? So say you have an estate of a million, uh, say you have an estate of $2 million, including your Martha's Vineyard house, which is worth 500000 or 25%, right? They figure out the Massachusetts estate tax on $2 million, they take 25% of that, that's your Massachusetts estate tax. And you're gonna to have to pay that before you can sell your property because when you die, there's automatically a lien on your property to make sure the estate taxes get paid. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? We got, we got a million of them. Yes? I just want to My friend Sandy Cordobi. For those of you who know, everybody knows Sandy Cordobi. Right? We, she's been on my presentations before, the geriatric care manager from Horizons Geriatric. Yes. Thank you. Um, I think they, to sort of answer, um, just comment on Frank's comment about, you know, can we just sort of leave everything alone and everybody's happy and fine for now. This community offers some sort of unique challenges in the event of a crisis. And I have three of them going on right now, whereas Windermere is not taking anybody right now. So if there is wow, a crisis, and a major stroke, say, or a car accident, or something that, that means that nursing home care, um, either nursing home care or in-home care, nursing home care is uh, on the vineyard is about 130 to 140,000 a year. There is no insurance to pay for that other than Mass Health or long-term care insurance. 
or, um, or in-home care, staying home with a 24-7 live-in caregiver is about $85,000 a year. Because we're so limited as to assets here, meaning where you can go if you get in trouble or how to get a hold of care that you may need, you may need to plan differently than if you lived over on the continent, as I like to say, um, where you've got a lot of options if something devastating happens um, if you don't want to end up over in Falmouth in a nursing home or you don't want your spouse or mom or dad or loved one to. So that's one of the things that, that we talk a lot about with our clients is, um, but we're a little different. And sometimes the pre-planning is more important if you intend to stay here. And who would ever want to leave, right? I mean, who would ever want to? Any other questions? If not, thank you very much for coming. And we'll see you next year. Happy, happy holidays. Thank you.